when we get inside. But while we're out here, I want to introduce uh, our famous library lions. This is fortitude. And uh, the one further away is patience. And why are there lions in front of the library? Well, lions were ancient symbols of learning. And where did the names patience and fortitude uh, come from? They weren't the original names. Uh, uh, people gave them various names playing on, on the names Astor and Lennox, uh, which I'll talk about uh, Astor and Lennox later, but none of those names stuck. And then during the Great Depression, the beloved mayor of New York City, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, decided to name them Patience and Fortitude because he said he wanted to remind New Yorkers that those were the qualities that we'd need to get through the hard economic times of the Depression. And people liked those names, so they stuck. And we still need Patience and Fortitude to get through the hard times of the pandemic. And, and Patience and Fortitude have been trying to help us. They were uh, wearing masks. Uh, now, how can you tell them apart? They're identical uh, uh, twins, both male lions, uh, although with all the dirt and grime of Fifth Avenue, uh, you can't always tell that they're made out of pink Tennessee marble, but every 10 years a portable lion spa comes in and, and cleans them up and you can see the pink better. And the way you remember who's who is by 42nd Street, 42, Fortitude, who's the, the northmost lion, and so by default uh, we've got Patience as the, the southern lion. So let's go inside the library now. Uh, there are two entrances. The one on 42nd Street, you come in at the ground floor. It's the European uh, numbering system. But if you uh, come in from Fifth Avenue, you're right in Astor Hall. And this may remind you of another great New York building, the Great Hall of Grand Central Terminal. Now, the, the library was completed in 1911, Grand Central in 1913. And in those early days, people got confused. They'd, uh, come rushing over to the information desk in Astor Hall and want to know what track their train was leaving on. And the confusion was understandable because these are two of the great masterpieces of the Beaux-Arts style in the United States. Uh, and they're very similar ex in, in the, their great halls, except that we don't have the constellations of the stars on the ceiling here. Now, what is Beaux-Arts architecture? Uh, it's a neoclassical style. It, its name comes from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts or the School of Fine Arts in Paris where most of the leading 19th century architects studied. And it may remind you uh, as a, a neoclassical style of the architecture of the ancient Greeks and Romans. The, the pillars, for example, over here are very like the pillars of a, a Roman temple. We've got the vaulted ceiling, the arched windows and over the doors, these triangles known as pediments. These are all characteristics of classical style. And the main feature of classical style was symmetry. The ancients believed that all beauty uh, uh, came from harmony and balance. So we have matching uh, candelabras at the entrance of Astor Hall, uh, another pair in the back. Although we only see one of the sweeping staircases, there's an identical one on the other side. And as you go on the virtual tour, notice all the good things that come in twos. But of course, the library is more than just a beautiful building. I like to say that the New York Public Library is the world's greatest tuition-free university because anybody from anywhere in the world or even another planet can come through these doors, go into any reading room in the library and be granted a library card on the spot that is good for the uh, research building. Now, th this building, the official name these days is the Stephen A. Schwartzman building named after a donor. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful, so the uh, librarians and others have abbreviated to SASB, S-A-S-B, uh, and we call it SASB, but for many of us, it, we still think of it as the main branch or just the library with a capital L. And finally, the, the library is an outstanding example of democracy in action, and there's something special here in Astor Hall that illustrates that. You see, I'm, I'm pointing to this square, uh, which is framed in a, a dark black marble that makes it pop out from the others. And there's writing inside. I call this the memorial to the unknown reader, uh, kind of like the, the tomb of the unknown soldier, although nobody is buried here, but somebody is buried under a New York public library. If you go to another research library, the Schomburg Center for Black Culture in Harlem, beneath that at his own request are the ashes of the great African-American poet Langston Hughes. Uh, 
But here, our unknown reader does have a name, Martin Radke, but unless you've been on the tour before, I, I don't expect you've ever heard of Martin Radke, so I'll tell you about him. In 1910, Martin Radke was a penniless young man in Lithuania. Like many people then and now, he dreamed of coming to the new world and making his fortune. And he didn't speak much English, but he did have gardening skills. So he was able to get a job as a gardener on Long Island. And uh, within time, he improved his English to the extent that he could come into this library. And with the help of our wonderful research librarians, he gave himself a crash course in economics and finance. And Martin Radke was a brilliant student. He became a successful Wall Street investor. And when he died in 1973, he left an estate of $368,000, which in today's money would make him a, mil a millionaire. Uh, he'd never married or had children, so Martin Radke left his entire fortune to the New York Public Library. The trustees had not previously been aware of him uh, before they, they read the will, but they were so moved by his generous bequest and the words of his will that they put his own words inside, and I, I'm going to read them to you. He said, I have little opportunity for formal education as a young man in Lithuania, and I am deeply indebted to the New York Public Library for the opportunity to educate myself. In appreciation, I've given the library my estate with the wish that it be used so that others can have the same opportunity made available to me. And that in a nutshell is what the New York Public Library is all about. Our mission is to inspire lifelong learning, to advance knowledge, and to strengthen our communities. And thank you for supporting that mission with your presence on this uh, virtual tour. Now, right now, the library is not open, uh, except by appointment only to researchers, but uh, all the collections are digitized. I mean, you can go to nypl.org, the website, and uh, make use of uh, the materials there. And the good news is that we do expect by September uh, the building will be opened again and, and uh, tours will resume. So we're going to now uh, go to another picture of Astor Hall. Uh, I'm showing you the busiest time of the year. Some people come in just to see this beautiful uh, Christmas tree, but it's also a time of school breaks. So we've had as many as 30,000 visitors in one day. Uh, the average number of visitors is 13,000 uh, uh, visitors in one day. The reason I chose this picture actually was to get a close up of these pylons. As you can see, there are names engraved. The library has an attitude of gratitude. Everybody who donates to the library gets thanked one way or another. And uh, some of the most generous benefactors have their names engraved here. And on this pylon, we have the names of uh, the original benefactors. And there are four that we consider the founding fathers of the New York Public Library. Their names are Astor, Lennox, Tilden, and Carnegie. Uh, few people know this, but in 1895, the library was consolidated under the name New York Public Library, Astor, Lennox, and Tilden Foundations, and that's still its official name. It's not just the New York Public Library. So I don't have time to give detailed biographies, but I'll tell you that Astor and Lennox were founders of New York City's first free research libraries, the Astor Library downtown in 1854, the Lennox Library uptown in uh, 1877, and these were semi-public libraries. Now, up until this time, although we think of libraries as places that let people in, they were really designed to let people out. You had to pay a membership fee to join a library, and most people couldn't do that. So it was an advance that the, the Astor and Lennox libraries were free, but they were very selective. The, the hours were deliberately made unfriendly to working people, the Astor Library had a huge sign outside that said no children or dogs. And the director liked to boast, this is a library for men of leisure and men of learning. So you get the drift. Nevertheless, uh, scholars were able to uh, do their, their work uh, without having to worry about, about paying a membership fee. And uh, uh, there were women who used uh, uh, the libraries. Uh, uh, they weren't kept out. So. By the early 1890s, though, both of these libraries were failing financially. The public wasn't supporting something that wasn't truly public, and the uh, descendants of the original founders had, had lost interest. So that's where Samuel J. Tilden comes into our story. He was a former governor of New York State, a progressive governor, and an unsuccessful candidate uh, for the presidency. And he had no direct descendants, and he had a, a fortune in excess of $7 million. And he decided 
that he would leave it all to found a, tr a true New York public library. Because like many people in the Gilded Age, he was eager, eager to put New York City on a par with the great uh, cities of Europe by having a true public library with a prestigious research component uh, comparable to the, the great libraries in, in Paris and London and, and Rome and other cities, but also that would, would allow the general public in that would have a centralized location. So whether you lived uptown, downtown, east or west, you could get there easily and that would have hours that were congenial uh, for working folks, an adult lending library and a children's center. Now he died thinking that he had accomplished uh, that mission. And uh, as I said, they uh, consolidated under the name New York Public Library, Astor Lennox and Tilden Foundation. The, the Astor and Lennox Foundation uh, uh, together contributed about a million books and, and uh, Tilden had 20 mil million rare volumes of his own, but there was a glitch. Tilden hadn't counted on his nieces and nephews. They contested the will and long story short, the New York Public Library only got a fraction of the Tilden estate. Now there were other generous donors, but it still wasn't enough because I'll be honest with you, libraries are very high maintenance institutions. You have to keep adding to the collections. The care can be uh, very costly. Uh, but I hope by the end of the tour, you'll agree with me that they're absolutely the best investment a democratic society can make in itself. Now, at this point, the trustees had a genius idea. They went to the elected officials of the city of New York and said, will you create with us a unique public-private partnership to bring the New York Public Library into being? And the politicians were thrilled to be part of this prestigious project. They said, of course we will. And the trustees said, that's great because you own the land where we want to put the library and we'd like you to donate it. And it was the very spot where the SASB building is today, next to uh, Bryant Park, which was already there. The trustees agreed with the philosopher Cicero that if you have a library and a garden, you have everything you need. So Bryant Park would be the garden with the library adjacent. One minor problem, there was already a building on the site of the library, but it wasn't really a problem because it was the Croton Distributing Reservoir and it hadn't been used in years. The city had moved the water system. So it was just a, a question of tearing down the reservoir and constructing the library. Now, first they needed to get an architect. So in 1897, they held a competition and you see here the winners of the competition. These busts are in the library. If you go up this, when you enter on Fifth Avenue, you, you turn right and uh, go up the stairs and there's a landing and in the alcove, there's this bronze bust of John Mervyn Career and his partner, Thomas Hastings, Hastings is on the other side, uh, a marble bust by the famed sculptor of the day, Frederick uh, McManis, who also uh, did some of the sculptures on the outside of the library. Now, nobody had expected Career and Hastings to win the competition. Uh, the leading architecture firm of the day was McKim, Mead and White. They were the architects of Columbia University and they had just built the Boston Public Library to great acclaim. So it was a bit like an upset night at the Oscars because uh, Carrera and Hastings were actually the least well-known of the established architects who entered the competition. They had met as students at uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in Paris. And then they trained under McKim, Mead and White. They were upstaging their own mentors here uh, for three years. And then they decided to form a, a partnership and went off on their own. Now, Hastings father was a well-connected society minister and his parishioners and friends became their first clients. And they were designing uh, luxurious homes for the wealthy. But they were idealists. They belonged to a movement known as the City Beautiful Movement. And though I doubt anybody in the City Beautiful Movement was familiar with the term Feng Shui, in fact, they had the same central organizing principle, namely that we're all very influenced by the energies of our environment. And the City Beautiful folks believed that if you built beautiful public buildings, not only would you make people feel better, but you would inspire them to do better and be promoting civic virtue. So the library was Career and Hastings' first major civic commission, and they were really thrilled. And they vowed that they would create a people's palace of learning. And uh, the people's palace is still the, the nickname of the library today. Uh, palaces take time. Uh, this one took a dozen years. It took 500 workers two years just to uh, dismantle the reservoir 
and then another 10 years to construct the building. And by the way, the city of New York, not only did they uh, generously donate the land, which even in those days was valued at $20 million, and in today's money, that would be about $500 million, but they also paid for the entire construction uh, of the building, uh, which with cost overruns was $9.2 million, and nobody's ever suggested it wasn't worth every penny. Now, what the city didn't pay for was the maintenance and adding to the collections, and that's where the private sector came in. And by the way, the New York Public Library is still a public-private partnership. It's not a government library like the Library of Congress, and the funding is still about 50-50, but uh, these days, most of the government funding goes to the circulating or branch libraries, and the research libraries get most of the uh, private sector money. So finally, on May 23rd, 1911, the library was completed and there was a public dedication ceremony. And this was such a big deal that the dedication was performed by the president of the United States himself. That was William Howard Taft who came up from Washington DC and talked about the national and historic importance of the New York Public Library where anybody, no matter what his origins or socioeconomic status could come in and have access to knowledge. And as Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. That's why they tried to, to keep uh, people out of the libraries uh, that weren't in the elite uh, in the early days. So the next day, the library opened to the public for the first time and an estimated 50,000 visitors streamed in, which was truly impressive uh, for the year 1911. And perhaps even more impressive, the first book was delivered to the first patron in under seven minutes. So. New York City had arrived on the cultural map with a world-class state-of-the-art public library. And I say state-of-the-art because this was one of the first buildings in New York City to have both elevators and electric lights. Now the library continues to evolve. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you about uh, uh, this newest part of the library, the Southport building. But first I want you to be aware that although uh, the SASB building is still the jewel in the crown architecturally, it is not the only New York Public Library. These days there are 92 individual New York Public Libraries. Four of them are research libraries. The, uh, this building is the Central Research Library for the Humanities and Social Sciences. I mentioned the Schomburg Center for Black Culture in, in Harlem. Up at Lincoln Center, there's a research library for the performing arts. And there's also a library we call SIBL, which stands for Science, Industry, and Business Library. That used to be on Madison Avenue between 34th and 35th in the old uh, B. Altman building, but very recently in May, it moved into uh, what is now called the Stavros Niarchos uh, Library. It used to be the Mid-Manhattan Library, and that's the largest of the branch libraries or circulating libraries. And it's located across the street from SASB and half a block south. Now, there are 88 of these branch and circulating libraries uh, today, and the founding father of the branch libraries was Andrew Carnegie. In 1901, he donated $5.2 million and that seated the first 37 of what has grown to be 88 branch libraries, which are spread across three boroughs of New York, Manhattan, uh, the Bronx and Staten Island. Why not Brooklyn and Queens? Well, in 1895, Brooklyn and Queens were invited to join the New York Public Library, but they declined. Uh, the city was not incorporated until 1898 and Brooklyn and Queens hadn't been waiting around. They had formed their own library systems. And when people are independent, they don't lightly give that up. So they said, no, thank you. And they're still saying it today. There is some interlibrary uh, cooperation among Brooklyn Queens and NYPL, but they are independent entities. And you can't take out a book from one of the NYPL branch libraries with a Queens or Brooklyn card. However, the good news uh, and for you enlargement as well is that anybody who lives or works anywhere in New York state, not just the city, but the state, uh, can get a free card to the branch libraries and anybody from anywhere in the world can use the research libraries. Uh, so the library does continue to evolve. And in uh, the early 20th century, our, our far seeing librarians realized a, a, a digital revolution was coming and they wanted to be prepared and they suggested that uh, we needed to expand. And the perfect place to expand was what had once been the South Courtyard. In 1911, people uh, rode up to the South Courtyard on horses and tied them up uh, there and then came into the library to work. 
Uh, in the 20th century, it was pretty much dead space. So uh, in 2001, uh, the library hired the architects uh, Davis Brody Bond, and they built the first above ground structure to be added to the library since 1911. What we're looking at this part is staff offices. Uh, there are also the first digital learning labs uh, went in on the, the uh, first floor level and also uh, classrooms where they've had ESL and various other classes, computer classes. And on the ground level, there's, there's uh, well, the concourse level, there's an auditorium where they have many wonderful public programs. There's also uh, on the first floor level, I like to show people on the tour, Davis Brody Bond deliberately left open part of the foundation when they excavated so that visitors could see that Carrera and Hastings had incorporated some of the reddish gray uh, uh, marble from the original uh, Croton Reservoir because they wanted to acknowledge and honor its previous heritage. So now we're going to go down the north-south corridor toward the periodical room. And while we're here, I want to talk a little more about the building. Uh, you can see that this marble is different from the marble in Astor Hall. That's a stark white with black veins running through. This is more golden. Now the marble in Astor Hall is the same marble that's used on the outside of the building. It has a uh, a facing a foot thick, and it was the largest marble structure of its time when it, when it was built. And the marble in Astor Hall and on the outside comes from Vermont and Career and Hastings uh, gave strict instructions to, to the uh, quarries in Dorset and Danby, Vermont. We only wanna see your very finest white Vermont marble and only the finest was sent. Nevertheless, the architects were so fastidious that they rejected 65% of this finest marble. And we don't need to feel too sorry for the rejected Vermont marble. It did find its way into many other uh, distinguished buildings, including Harvard Medical School. But Career and Hastings were not impressed. They said, well, it may be good enough for Harvard. It's not good enough for the People's Palace. We only want the very best here. And this golden marble is what they considered the best of the best. It's a Greek pentallic marble that's identical to the marble in the Parthenon Temple in Athens, the great temple of classical learning. And we feel fortunate to have it because that quarry is now deplete and you can't get this marble anymore. Now, next, notice the ceiling. Uh, I ask people on the tour to guess what it's made out of. And usually they guess wood or sometimes copper. And these are great guesses, exactly what the architect uh, wanted us to think. However, it's actually molded plaster stained to look like wood and they use a special uh, gold paint to get this coppery effect. There's only one real wood ceiling in, in the library. It's in Gottesman Hall and we'll, we'll get to that slide uh, soon. But why didn't they use wood everywhere? Well, remember there was a reservoir on the ground before and the, the ground was uh, wet. So they felt they were risking, if they put wood everywhere, they risked that the wood ceilings would eventually warp and it would be prohibitively expensive to recreate the ceilings and their artistry would be lost forever. So they created these magnificent faux wood ceilings, even the, the uh, coffered ceiling in the Rosemain reading room is molded plaster, not wood. So when we come to the, well, I guess I have to click in a certain spot. All right, I'll click on the arrow. Um, we come to the periodical room and uh, the periodical room is where you'd go to get the most requested English and foreign language uh, periodicals. So you can read the New York Times there or Paris Match in, in, in French. And of course today, some of them are only uh, electronic versions. Sometimes you have a choice between electronic or, or hard copy, but there are several thousand uh, different publications. Now, what do you do if you want older material? Well, you go to the Rosemain Reading Room and either they, they bring up the older material from the stacks or they send you to room 119, which is the microfilm room if it's on microfilm. Now this room is named after DeWitt Wallace, the founder of the Reader's Digest. And the Reader's Digest was actually born in the periodical room of the New York Public Library. Uh, DeWitt Wallace and his wife Lila lived in Greenwich Village in the 1920s. And on their way to work, they'd stop in, in the periodical room and uh, read the, the Times and other publications. And one day DeWitt Wallace realized that nobody had time or money enough to read all the best articles because they weren't just in two or three publications, but scattered across hundreds. So he proposed to Lila that they come and copy out by hand the, the very best articles and then edit them so they'd all fit into one volume and they could call it the Reader's Digest. 
she thought it was a great idea. And for the first three years of its existence, that's exactly how, how the Reader's Digest was created by uh, DeWitt and Lila. And it was a huge success. When I was a child growing up in the 1950s, every doctor's waiting room in America had a copy of the Reader's Digest and it was second in sales only to the Bible. So when the Wallaces became wealthy, they started a philanthropic foundation. And in the early 80s, when the periodical room was, was crying out for renovation, the DeWitt Wallace paid for the entire renovation. And one thing the foundation did was to commission a living artist, Richard Haas, uh, who's renowned for his architectural paintings, to create these murals. So that when you come through these doors, it's like stepping back in time to the heyday of New York uh, publishing. All of these buildings represent uh, uh, buildings from the New York publishing industry. This one you may recognize, it's the iconic New York Times building that stood in Times Square for many years. It looks a bit like the Flatiron building does now. And then all the great book publishers are shown in their original buildings. This was what's now Harper Collins and then was uh, Harper and Brothers and it was down on Pearl Street in lower Manhattan. We have Herald Square where they published uh, the, the Evening Herald uh, newspaper and there are iconic uh, magazine buildings, the Puck Building, uh, the Time Life Building, uh, Newspaper Row, which was down by City Hall. And then there's another doorway that looks like this one framed in a, a gray Formosa marble from Germany. And over that one, there's a, a, a small mural of a little pink building that was the Reader's Digest uh, building that was near Pleasantville, New York. And Haas used a technique called trompe l'oeil, which means fool the eye in French. And when you're in the room, it really seems as if the buildings are coming uh, off the wall at you. Now, when we go through the doorway with the uh, Reader's Digest painting over it, we come to the Durot uh, collection. It's an open doorway. Uh, so people are always peering in to see what, what's, what's here. And this is one of the library's, what they call special collections. Most of them are not open to the public. They're grouped around some theme or geographic area and they're, they have a lot of valuable materials for scholars uh, only. You have to apply to, to get credentials to, to use it. But there is one public uh, collection that I'll talk about later, the art and architecture collection. Except for the Durow collection, all the special collections are on the third floor. But uh, uh, this one, uh, because of the open doorway, you can get a glimpse of uh, uh, even if you're not a researcher. And Duro is a Hebrew word meaning generations. And the Duro collection is the library's outstanding collection of Hebraic and Judaica. The core collection was donated by the Schiff family in 1897. Today it's maintained and added to by the Duro Foundation. That's where the name comes from. You can see also they have LED lighting, so it's a little brighter. Um, it's about 40% in the Hebrew language. Most of the modern languages represented as well as Yiddish and Ladino. And on the scholarly side, they have the first Hebrew prayer book published in the United States for the Harvard Divinity School students. On the popular side, they have recipes for bagels and Winnie the Pooh and Sherlock Holmes in Yiddish. They, whoop, they also have uh, beautiful artworks, including some, some priceless illuminated 17th and 18th century wedding ketubit. Uh, uh, that's wedding certificates called Ketubit. So now we go to Gottesman Hall and here is the one wood ceiling that I mentioned. It's a beautiful carved oak ceiling in Renaissance uh, style by a famous sculptor of the day, Maurice uh, Greaves. And, and uh, because it's a beautiful room, it's often used for weddings and, and corporate parties. But now they have just finished setting up an exhibit that when the library reopens, we'll all be able to see a permanent exhibit called Treasures of the New York Public Library. And uh, once again, the Gutenberg Bible, which the New York Public Library has the first Gutenberg Bible brought to the United States by uh, James Lennox, who was very proud of that acquisition. That will be on permanent uh, display uh, along with some of the other treasures that uh, have been behind closed doors in the rare books room or, or elsewhere uh, so that everybody uh, can see them. We have a smaller gallery, the Walkenheim Gallery, that's directly across from Southport. Um, but there really isn't a lot of exhibition space in the library, so they get creative. They use the corridors on the, the third floor often for, for print exhibitions. So now we come to the map room and you can see it's similar in layout to the periodical room, but it, it's got its own un, unique uh, forward ceiling, which you can see some red here. There's also some, some green over here. 
And uh, the Map Room is one of the five uh, uh, greatest map collections in the world. And it's used by the media and the military as well as people like ourselves. It is a public uh, reading room. Anybody can, can go in. You can research your, your own uh, uh, property uh, if you want, but they have 500,000 sheet maps, about 20,000 books and atlases and all kinds of globes, including this one, uh, uh, which people make a beeline for it because it's so big. And then they put their finger uh, on it and say, here we are in New York City. And so many people have done this that there's now just a shiny white spot where New York City used to be. So New York City doesn't exist on this, this globe. They have every kind of map you can imagine, but the strength of the collection is in New York City maps from the earliest uh, times of the Dutch settlements. They have hand, hand uh, drawn antique 400 year old maps of that, uh, right up to the latest subway map, which you can actually take with you when you, when you leave the room. Uh, then we go down a long corridor to room 121. And uh, again, this is a public room. It's the Milstein Division of US History, Local History and Genealogy. It's unique among uh, rooms in the library in that it has open stacks. You, you, can, you don't have to fill out a call slip. You can browse to your heart's content, take a book off the shelf, sit at one of the tables and, and read and come back the next day and, and read some more. You can't take the books out. It's not a circulating library, uh, but it does offer more access and they, they have both popular and historical uh, scholarly works of, of history. It's also a, a, a leading genealogical center and uh, uh, uniquely, it is free. If you want to use Ancestry.com without paying a fee, come here. But better yet, you can uh, make a free appointment with a research librarian who will help you navigate the birth and death indexes. They have the ship manifest from uh, Ellis Island and all the other documents you might need to find out more about your, your ancestors uh, when they came to this country. Now we're going to descend to the ground floor where they have the Children's Center. Although I believe the Children's Center has now been moved over to the Stavros Niarchos uh, uh, Library and Winnie the, Winnie the Pooh and friends whom you're seeing here, they are going into the Treasures Collection. So you'll still be able to see them in, uh, in this building. But what is Winnie the Pooh doing in the New York Public Library? You can see he and his little friends are right at home. They, they've painted the 100 acre woods behind them. Well, it's a bit of a sad story of how they, they came here. Um, when he grew up, Christopher Robin Milne became estranged from his father, A.A. A. Milne, the author of the Winnie the Pooh books. And uh, he felt he'd been exploited uh, in the, the books and he really didn't want the animals around as painful reminders of, of uh, the estrangement. So he donated them to his publisher, E.P. Dutton, who uh, gave them to the library so that, that uh, people could come and see the, these cherished uh, uh, friends of their childhood. And so here they are, all the original animals, except for Rue. The Milnes went in a picnic, Rue uh, fell out of Kangas pouch and was never seen again. But Piglet is my, my favorite here. And uh, uh, we got a lot of visitors asking for them once when they had to go to the animal hospital and, and Winnie, Winnie had uh, complications from stomach surgery and they all had to travel at once for insurance purposes. So for a year, uh, Winnie and his friends were gone. And I, I think there, there was more distress over that than anything else in the library. People were constantly coming in and saying, when is Winnie coming back? Um, so uh, this is also the Children's Center. It's not just the home of Winnie the Pooh. It's also a circulating uh, library for children up to the age of 11. Uh, they have books and other materials, but it, it is moving into or has moved into the Stavros uh, Niarchos because uh, that's where the circulating, that's a circulating library. Now we go up to the second floor and on the second floor, most of the rooms are not open to the public. They're dedicated for the use of, of writers and scholars to do their work. But there is this one section in the middle uh, known as the Joe Cup and uh, Rose uh, Gallery. And there, here you see a special uh, exhibition on, on on immigration, but also they have a permanent uh, collection of photographs, both of the main branch and some of the branch libraries, artifacts from them, uh, photographs of people I talk about on the tour, like Astor and, and Lennox, a picture of the Lennox Library, which stood where the Frick collection is now, uh, so that you can see what it was like uh, before it was uh, torn down. And it's worth a visit as a, a supplement to the tour too, to really see what we're talking about. 
And now we go to the third floor. And when you step off the third floor elevator, right now there's just one elevator. So this is, this is what you see when you step off. They are actually constructing another elevator, which I hope will be uh, ready uh, for service uh, uh, by the time the library reopens in, in September. Right now the library is only open uh, uh, by appointment only uh, to researchers uh, for uh, a, on a limited basis, but the plan for now is to reopen in, in September. So what you see when you get off the elevator is a glass door that looks right into the Berg collection. This is the Berg collection. Uh, I'll tell you, it is my favorite because it, it's uh, a great collection of uh, English, well, British and American literature. And it, it, there are over 400 authors represented from the 15th century to the present. And the strength is really in modern literature from the 19th century on. Now it was the gift of the man shown in this painting. This is Dr. Albert Berg, given in loving memory of his brother, Dr. Henry Berg, who was much older and really had raised Albert. The Berg brothers were both physicians at Mount Sinai Hospital. I think Henry was actually an in infectious diseases. We could use him now. Um, he was a pioneer in that field. And uh, they lived together uh, all of uh, Henry's life. Uh, they were confirmed bachelors. And they also speculated very successfully in real estate. And with their real estate earnings, they indulged their mutual passion uh, for rare books. So you, you see, James Joyce and John Milton. And then this was actually uh, Owen Young who had another collection. And when, when Henry died, Albert bought Young's collection and another collection and donated all three uh, collections to the New York Public Library. Um, now, the Berg brothers' favorite author was Charles Dickens. So there was a lot of uh, Dickensiana in, in the donation and not only books, although they, they did donate the, or Albert donated the original manuscript of uh, one of the great uh, Dickens masterpieces, Bleak House, and also all of Dickens' personal copies of his books, uh, many of which were marked up for his dramatic readings uh, because he, he knew that what reads well on the page doesn't necessarily make the best public reading. So he, he edited accordingly. And every Christmas, they create a special exhibit around the, what, they, what they call the prompt copy of a Christmas Carol and you can see Dickens own handwriting. The calendar on the desk is open to the day he died and everything except the flower uh, uh, was Dickens uh, personal possession, including the desk and the chair. Now, when the Burke collection was dedicated in, in 1940, Mayor LaGuardia performed the dedication and he sat in the Dickens chair. If you've ever seen a picture of Mayor LaGuardia, you know he was a rather heavy set uh, man and this is a cane chair. So midway through his speech, the entire bottom fell out of the Dickens chair. Well, the library had it recaned, but from that day forward, no one, not even the currently very petite curator of the, of the Berg collection, gets to sit in the Dickens chair. It's strictly for, for viewing only. Okay, so we, when we go down uh, the corridor, we pass the other special collections. Most of them have wood doors, so you can't see in, but there is another one with a clear door, the Forsheimer collection, which is uh, basically the English romantic poet Shelley and his circle is, is the strength of that collection. So you can peer in there. And then you come to the McGraw Rotunda. Now, strictly speaking, this is not really a rotunda. A rotunda should be a perfect circle and uh, it's got square corners, but it's rotunda-ish. And these paintings were not here when the library was completed in 1911. They were all added during the Great Depression. There were actually two other murals on the other side. And if you remember during the depression, we had a special agency known as the Works Progress Administration or WPA. And part of that was the federal art project because the WPA gave jobs to the unemployed and artists too were unemployed. So they were commissioned to decorate public buildings and the lucky artist that got this commission uh, was named Edward Lanning Jr. And he was so thrilled that he actually painted a thank you note into this mural. It's addressed to Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes, who uh, was not only a trustee of the library, but a head honcho in the WPA. And he was both instrumental in getting Lanning the commission uh, to decorate the library. And because he was a wealthy man, Phelps Stokes, from his own pocket paid for all the expensive artist materials, the oil paints, the canvases, the brushes, et cetera. Uh, 
if you go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they have a, a wonderful John Singer Sargent uh, portrait of Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes and his wife uh, in their tennis whites. Uh, uh, they were, uh, you know, affluent and sporty. So the, the four murals, you know, I have to say they're not great art. They remind me of the Soviet art of the, the Stalinist era, but they do tell a great story. And it's the history of the recorded word in the West. The two that are off screen, the first one shows uh, Moses descending from Mount Sinai with the stone tablets uh, containing the Ten Commandments. Next to that is one of a medieval monk copying a manuscript. Uh, this one celebrates the Gutenberg Bible and shows Johannes Gutenberg proudly displaying the first Bible to his patron, the uh, Elector of Mainz, Germany. And Gutenberg invented movable metal type in the West. It had already been invented in Korea 200 years earlier. And even before that, in China, they had movable porcelain type. But Gutenberg didn't know that. And we, we owe him a, a tremendous uh, debt. I mean, he went bankrupt uh, in the course of printing the, the Gutenberg Bible. But uh, he, he made reading possible for, for all of us and not just uh, uh, the elite and a few monks in, in monasteries. So. Then we come to this one, which is the celebration of the, the linotype machine, uh, which made possible the mass circulation newspaper. And this is the inventor of the linotype machine, uh, Otmar Mergenthaler. And this is a famous newspaper editor of the day, James Whitelaw Reed, uh, examining it. And of course, today we'd have to have a mural to celebrate the internet and computers, but I don't know where they'd put it. There's no space, so good thing it didn't exist in Lanning's day. Now he did paint these uh, lunettes over the doorway. On the other side is one called Learning to Read, which shows a mother reading to her young son. And this one is called The Student. And we library docents have decided because they actually resemble each other, that the student is supposed to be the little boy grown up and that Lanning was trying to tell parents, read your children so they grow up to be readers. Now, the two facing doorways are framed in a beautiful, rose-colored marble called Rue Jasp from the south of France. And it's one of the costliest uh, marbles in the library. We're going to go through these doors and that will bring us to the Edna Barn Solomon Room. Now you can see they're holding a corporate uh, party here uh, or perhaps a wedding reception, I don't know. But uh, uh, by day it is a reading room it's wired for Wi-Fi like all the reading rooms. And it's also the library's official picture gallery. It's arranged like a 19th century picture gallery. We have two pictures of George Washington, not by Gilbert Stuart, but by his, at the time, equally famous contemporary uh, Rembrandt Peel. And we do have some Gilbert Stuart uh, portraits of, of the uh, Lennox family. A lot of these, these uh, pictures are paintings of, of portraits of the Astor and Lennox families. But there are also some famous artists represented, uh, for example, Sir Joshua Reynolds. And uh, Truman Capote, in addition to donating all his papers to the library, donated a very nice uh, portrait of himself. Okay, then when we go across, we, we come to uh, an identical doorway to, to the one to the Solomon Room, but this one goes into the Bill Blast catalog room. Now people sort of get to the center of the McGraw Rotunda and are, if they don't know the library, they're bewildered. They go over to the information desk, I know, because I used to work there and say, I can't find the main reading room, where is it? And, and that's because it's behind the catalog room. And I'll tell you another secret, there are actually two Rose Main reading rooms. There is an identical North Hall and a South Hall. Remember that, that principle of symmetry. Plus it's a, a very uh, efficient way to deliver books. The librarians who are in the center in the book delivery system, they just have to turn around and can deliver to patrons on both sides. Now the catalog room was named for the fashion designer, Bill Blass, because in 1994, he donated uh, $10 million to the library. He was a trustee of the library. And this was the most generous gift that had been given uh, to date. Now, S Stephen A. Schwartzman donated $100 million. So the whole building is, is named after him. What you don't see in the catalog room is the old fashioned card catalogs with wooden boxes and little, little cardboard uh, cards. When I was a student using the library, they had that. It's all been replaced by these desktop computers. If you want to use a computer in the library, you can do that, but you borrow a laptop to do your own work or surf the internet. These desktops will only let you do two things. One is to surf the catalog of the New York Public Library to get the call slip of the, of the book you wanna 
the call number rather of the book you want to request because they have call slips in boxes next to the computers. And there's also a special app to apply for a library card. Uh, somebody asked me on the last tour, well, do, do they still have the cards? Uh, well, they photocopied them. So over on this wall, you can't really see them, but there, there's a whole wall of big black binders and it's the photocopies of the cards. Uh, the actual cards themselves, I'm sure, you know, libraries never throw anything out there somewhere, but I'm not sure where, perhaps on the stacks. Now, when we come to the end of uh, uh, the catalog room, uh, we, we see this beautiful doorway uh, uh, with some typical Beaux-Arts designs. The rosettes symbolize beauty and the ubiquitous uh, acanthus leaves are a symbol of immortality. And there's also a quote from the poet John Milton, a good book is the precious lifeblood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond uh, life. And that is from his defense of free speech, the Area Pygetica. The library has a rare first edition of the Area Pygetica. And uh, uh, we kind of consider Milton, the, the patron saint of, of the library. There's, a, as you saw, a bust of him in the Berg collection and also uh, a valuable painting uh, of him uh, in the Solomon Room. And he, he was the great defender of free speech. Now we come to the book delivery system. This, this was completely uh, uh, redone in, in 2016. And it has tracks like a roller coaster that spiral down uh, into the ground into uh, what are now uh, the library stacks, which are in Bryant Park. Under that grassy lawn that becomes the skating rink in the winter, there are 80 miles of book stacks. Two tiers of book stacks, each has 40, 40 miles of books, and there's a capacity for four and a half million books. Now they're up to four million, you always have to leave room uh, to grow. And then these little red cars, cars can transport 30 uh, uh, pounds of books at, at a time. Now, originally, the books were kept in the stacks that are in the building. Uh, you see them here, and they're, they still exist, and they're still very architecturally important because, as you can see, they hold up the Rosemain Reading Room. However, they have windows. Windows let in sun and moisture. And by the uh, 20th century, they realized that if you don't climate control stacks, uh, the older material especially will deteriorate quickly. So it was much more cost effective to just start over under Bryant Park, not have to worry about windows and they built the new stacks. And I'm sure someday they'll find some wonderful new use for, for uh, the, these stacks, which were quite state of the art for the time. Now we come to the South Hall of the Rose Main Reading Room. You can see the book delivery system is here. And I don't know if you know this, but both the reading room and the catalog room were closed for two full years because in May, 2014, there was an accident. This rosette came crashing down. Uh, luckily, it was 2 a.m., nobody was injured, and it fell right between the tables, so the furniture wasn't even much damaged. But it was a wake-up call. They suddenly realized that all 900 of these ornaments had been uh, glued to the ceiling in 1911 with the best glue of the day, but after 100 years, even the best glue starts to dry up. So they had to seal off both rooms for the safety of the public, and an engineering, an engineering firm did an evaluation and said, forget about glue, we're gonna to have to bolt everything to the ceiling. So everything had to come down, custom uh, uh, made cables like aircraft cables were, were made and one by one, everything was bolted back. And while they were in there, they installed the LED lighting, uh, uh, made some other improvements, including restoring these beautiful paintings of the ceiling. You may have noticed they also have them in, in the catalog room. What is the ceiling? Uh, of the New York Public Library doing with uh, the morning sky. Well, that was one of many innovations of the great uh, first director of the New York Public Library, Dr. John Shaw Billings. He was a medical doctor and an eminent medical librarian before he came to the library. And his greatest innovation was to put the reading room on the uh, third floor. In 1911, when you walked into a library, usually the first thing you saw was the reading room. And uh, he said, that's all wrong. It should be as far as possible from the noise, heat, dust of the street. And he wanted people to look up, see the morning sky and feel like they were looking directly into the heavens and become inspired. Um, so uh, the original paintings were done by James Wall Finn of the Tiffany uh, uh, Studios. And uh, sadly they deteriorated and the Evergreen Studio uh, did a great, great job of uh, recreating them uh, today. 
Now, the Rosemain Reading Room, both halls together, is the size of an American football field or two very long city blocks. About 540 people can sit at the uh, tables and, and work at, at one time. All these are the, it's the original uh, lamps and furniture. Everything was designed by Career and Hastings, but they had a team known as the Paris Men who actually executed. They were the, the designers. But in those days, architects designed inside as well as outside of uh, the building. Now, I'm sure you, you know uh, the library is a venue of great learning, but one thing you might not know is it's also a venue of romance. If you saw the movie Sex in the City, you may have recognized the McGraw Rotunda as the place where Carrie Bradshaw waited in her wedding gown for Mr. Big to come and marry her, and he never showed up, and they ended up getting married somewhere else. But uh, uh, in the real world, uh, uh, we have weddings and I've never heard of a bride or a groom not showing up because it's expensive to get married in the library. Most of us can't afford it, but the good news is that anybody free of charge can get their wedding pictures taken in the library in any reading room on the steps, uh, wherever uh, they want. And I, I've seen that as well as preparations for, for several weddings. Um, also, we give a special tour that we call the Lovebird Tour because several times a year, there are calls I would like to get to, to propose in the New York Public Library, can I do that? So the couple is sent off with their own uh, dedicated uh, docent on a private tour, and they can go to this corner uh, known as the Lovebird Corner uh, to propose. Now in the Lovebird Corner, there are some green encyclopedias similar to these, and one enterprising young man uh, got the library's permission to create a fake book that looked like one of the green encyclopedias, but it was hollow inside. And he filled it with pictures of himself and his, his fiance to be uh, having great times together. And when uh, they got there, he took it off the shelf and opened it up and they began to reminisce. And then he went down on one knee. And of course she said yes at once. Now, to my knowledge, nobody's ever been turned down on uh, uh, a lovebird tour of the New York Public Library. So if you're thinking of proposing or know anybody who is, please keep that in mind. Remember after September, uh, the lovebird tours uh, will resume. Uh, now the Art and Architecture Library is at the end, it's off screen here, but if you go down here, uh, you come to some swinging brown doors, they lead into room 300, and this is open to the public and it's worth a visit. They have over 600,000 items, everything to do with applied and fine art, in, in, including some uh, original fashion sketches, auction catalogs, uh, uh, Hastings, personals, uh, scrapbooks of, of buildings he, he admired. So I think, uh, I've gone maybe a little over time, so I'm going to stop the tour here and open it up for questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thank you very much, Joan, for that. That was great. Um, there's um, people who have questions in the chat, um, and we'll open up the questions for people uh, speaking in a moment. Um, if someone has a question, um, book was spelled B-O-O-K-E. I think that was in the cert, the um, Milton. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's how it was spelled then. I guess they want to know why it was spelled that way. Well, you know, they weren't consistent. I mean, if you've ever seen a, a, a Shakespearean fo folio and the library uh, does have a, a, an original folio, you know, he's, he spells words, even his own name differently at different times. Uh, that was kind of an 18th century thing. They began to get strict about making spelling and grammar and, and stuff like that consistent, but it, it wasn't always as noticeable, so they used alternate uh, uh, spellings. Also, if you notice the the uh, Gothic script, the S's look like F's, and that's why I, I read it to you. But you know, so it's it's uh, of its time rather than of ours. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, and we can have people.